3000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3000 Podcast. Before I get to today's guest, make sure you like and subscribe. I hate fucking doing that, but no one likes and subscribes. So I've got to say it. Anyway, enough of that shit. Uh, Today, I'm joined by a DJ, a turntablist, and a new Melbourneian, DJ Ms. Hap. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, man. How long have you been in Melbourne for now? I know it's not that long, but you are a a Melbourneian now. We can claim you. I have been called a Melbourneian now. I feel like a bit of a traitor, but yeah, I've been here for seven months now, man. That's, yeah, it's not that long, but I think you fit in pretty well. Yeah, I feel like I have. I feel like I have been lucky enough to find some good crew, so yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's talk about your musical journey, your personal sort of journey and how you got from, I believe, WA over Mm. to uh, the north side of Melbourne. Whereabouts did you uh, grow up? Um, I grew up in Brentwood, so that, I mean, yeah, I grew grew up in a few places, but Brentwood was where I spent the most time, um, Mm. down in Perth. Uh, Brentwood, Borgoon, and then like moving to Frio, being in Frio during high school and stuff. Yep. Um, yeah. Good spot, Frio. Yeah, Frio is dope. Yeah, it's got a, got a lot of uh, good culture, you know. Like if I was to move back home at some point, I'd probably want to live somewhere near Frio, but yep. yeah. For sure. Yeah, man. And so how does a, a young lady in Frio discover hip hop and decide that's what she's going to do? Um, I discovered hip hop through my mate Dave. So my mate David in year eight, um... Yeah, I remember, like, I kind of was a bit of a drifter. Like, I drifted between kind of all of the groups during school and decided I didn't really fit anywhere. Couldn't find your place? No, but then I found the stoners and I was like, (laughs) here I am. (laughs) Yeah, and they were cool, you know, and accepting and, um, yeah, just, you know, happy to be hanging out and just talking talking shit, I guess, and making some fun. So, um, yeah, I kind of found my space with those guys, but... Um, yeah, made some good mates and one of my good mates was Dave and one day he'd, uh, you know, asked me if I liked hip hop and I was like, yeah, man, like my favourite rappers are Biggie and Tupac and he was like, you haven't actually listened to hip hop, have you? Which I admittedly haven't really, I hadn't until that point, um, had only really heard of what was on the radio. So yeah, he gave me his iPod, next day he rocked up to school with uh, his iPod classic and it was just loaded with hip hop and... That's how I discovered it, man. So yeah, yeah. it's like a it's like a bit of a, a modern twist on a mixtape. He gave you an iPod loaded with all the good stuff. Yeah, dude, he really did. Yeah, and it had everything everything on there like Artifacts and Dale the Funky Homo Sapien, and that's where I found like Lord Finesse and DITC and Big L and yeah. all of that stuff. First time I'd heard Nas, and so yeah, I think it was one day that I'd heard like I mean when I got that iPod, I was like whoa, and just really like. Just pretty overwhelmed, to be honest. Yep. But, um, yeah, took it home and the first thing I'd listen to was Nas because he just had, like, a weird name. And I didn't know how to say it. Like, one of my mates would call him Nas. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, Nas. Like, N-A-S or, you know. And... Well, it is a funny one because we say nasty. Yeah. Nas. And it's that's what I believe it's short for. Or Nasir is his name. Mm. But well, he says that a lot, right? Yeah. Nasty Nas, Nas, Nasir. His name is Nasir, so it's Nas. Nas. Uh, but in America they say nasty. So it is sort of nasty. Do you know what I mean? It's a funny one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There you go. I don't say nasty. No, I, say, I do nasty. say nasty. So nas. Yeah, yeah. nasty. But nas. I feel like if an American said it, they might say nas, but then they'd say nas. Yeah, pretty much. But I, I'd basically, I'd yeah, listen into nas, and I'd listen to the It Was Written album, and that would that had just like pulled me right in. So. I love that album. It's yeah. a debatable thing, but I believe that that's in my point of view. That's a better album than Illmatic. But that's my that's my personal opinion. Illmatic has a lot of like hip hop anthems on it and like hip hop bangers of that that era, you know. But yeah, it was written definitely for me as well. Like just affirmative action and all of that, and the message like the message, yeah. the message I used to bump like every morning at like six thirty a.m. like walking to the train or as if I'd lived any of that life. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And but, what's the track after that? I think where he's like says it from the perspective of a gun as well. That's like yeah. um. Yeah, I used to flog that album, but I'm talking like 25 years. Yeah, I can't remember, man. It, it has been a long time since I've even listened to that album, you know. But that was what had like pretty much started my whole journey into hip-hop. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So from Nas, so you're pretty East Coast focused there with your Nas and your DITC sort of stuff. And yeah. that's where you, you into your boom bap sort of thing there? Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, I think it was only until recently that like, we were doing like the West Coast Wednesdays night. Um, that I'd realised how much of my taste sits within the East Coast stuff. Like, I love West Coast styles as well, but, mm. yeah, a lot of the East Coast stuff, you know, Rakim and Method and Woo and all of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, that's 
personal personal choice, but I'm I'm more down with that sort of stuff as well. Yeah. So then, do you are you thinking about DJing or what's happening there? Like you just you're just experiencing the music and you're listening to, you you you've got a mate who's who's across it. Yeah. And is he schooling you on this shit? Are you just doing your own research? Uh, yeah, he'd like school me a bit. Like David knew a lot about hip hop. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, props to him. And definitely, like, Steel Wood like, was a big knowledge book of hip-hop. But um, for me, I wasn't thinking about DJing at all. Like, uh, uh, my whole life I'd wanted to perform. Um, and, like, I guess when I was younger, you know, if people asked me, you know, what I, what I wanted to be when I grew up, whatever, I'd be like, I want to be a rock star. Mm-hmm. Or, like, you know, I want to be a singer and all of that. I think I always just wanted to sing. Like, I've always loved singing and uh, playing guitar and, you know, stuff like that. But I picked up guitar lessons when I was younger and I had this uh, teacher with super long nails and they creeped me out and so I just, like, stopped doing it. Yeah, like, on one hand he had real long nails and on the other hand, you know, for, like, the plucking and all. Yeah, and, I just, and he's pretty gross. Though. Yeah, it was gross. I just couldn't, you know, he had, like, long <laughs> grey hair. and. So if he, had, if he had manicured nails, you might have ended up being a, a guitarist. Maybe, maybe, but I just, I didn't really love the classical stuff. Like I didn't want to play classical guitar. I just wanted to like go straight to electric, you know, Yeah. and they always want to teach you traditional stuff, which is fair enough, you know, the basics of what you need to know. But um, yeah, I'd kind of like gone to guitar lessons and then stopped doing that and then like tried learning, you know, piano by ear and then kind of like put that aside. Um, my, bl- my brother played drums for a bit. Yep. Um, I tried to sit on the drum kit one day and like had no rhythm at all. You know, it just got really frustrated and gave it up. But then, yeah, when I hit about 17 was when I'd found DJing. So I was like living, living out of home. Um, I was like in a pretty like, oh, I was just like hanging out with people I shouldn't have been hanging out with and doing dumb yeah. shit and yeah, was trying, your, trying to be queen of the streets. You was know. it your choice to leave home? Yeah, yeah. Like I'd always been you know, pretty wild child and, like, be button heads with my parents and just be a bit fiery, you know, like, didn't want to be – ever be told what to do even though I was a child. So, yep. yeah, just, you know, always threatening to leave home and leaving home and then, yeah, I guess when I was 15 I'd moved out of my parents because they'd split up and I'd moved and lived with my grandma and she was living in Mosman Park near Frio. So I'd spend a lot of time in Mozzie Park and then a lot of the time after school I'd just be hanging out with my mates and then, you know, getting up to nonsense and then I'd go stay at my grandma's and all that. But at some point during that journey I'd, I was living um, – I'd, I'd left John Curtin, so I was going to John Curtin for school and I'd end, gone there for acting. So The performance stuff. Yeah, all the performance stuff and, I, you know, I kind of like realised, oh, I don't want to be an actor, I want to get into music and like, do less of this. So I'd gone to South Fremantle and then from South Fremantle I'd kind of dropped out. I was working at this pub uh, in Coogee, Ed's Sports Bar, even when you're underage? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wasn't working behind a bar as oh, okay, such. Yeah. Like, I was working as a dishy, but I was doing, like, all-rounder stuff. Like, yeah. I don't think I ever poured a drink, but, yeah. yeah, I was definitely, like, still working in front of house a bit and all of that. But mostly just being a dish pig. And, um, yeah, <laughs> dish pig. I love that job, man. You know, you just put your headphones in and you work your ass off and get a bit dirty and then you leave. But, yeah, I think through that I'd just, yeah, I was, I'd kind of met, yeah, some some crew I shouldn't have really been hanging around at that age and ended up, you know, like trying to do all the like this and that and doing all of that street stuff. And then, yeah, I got a call from my stepmom one day and she's like, yeah, I thought of DJing. And no, I hadn't because the only DJs I knew of were like David Guetta and Havana Brown and all that. Uh, you know, and I was kind of like, that's yeah. not really my pocket, but I figured it would, it was probably time to get away from what I was doing and it would be like a good step into, you know, like performing or... Yep. And then, yeah, just fell in love with DJing, man. So yeah. 10 years in, here I am. But, so what was your first DJ setup? What did you get? Um, I had like – I'd hired from the guy that I learned how to DJ from. So through my stepmom, she'd gotten me to um, meet up with this guy called Matty from Ultimate DJ Productions in Mandra. Mm-hmm. And he ran his own – like I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still running it, like his own mobile DJ company and yep. all of that. And um, – yeah, through that I'd like learnt how to use equipment and all and he'd provided me with like this really small like C D J four hundreds. Like yeah. yeah, they had a USB, but Yeah, they, they had USB and you could record straight up. They it, didn't like. have record box. <laughs> but it was great because like I learned yeah, I didn't learn through like record box or through visual yeah. media or through like reading, you know, like waveforms on a controller or anything. Like I just just learned through like yeah, it was just hearing. like a digital display screen with no waves on it. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It just had like the time remaining. Great way to learn. Great way to learn, man. And you could record your mixes straight onto the USB. So I would just spend like hours up in my bedroom just like trying to record these mixes like 
one-off takes onto the USB. How did you... Oh, because Kept you used the CDs and then record straight to the USB. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Because there's just a record function and just records the audio file. I had them. I didn't even know you could record these. Yeah, man. Just one button. One Super button. easy. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then you've got that DJ set up. What mixer are you running with that? Uh, I feel like it was a... What was it? It was a 450, I think, DJ M450. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Super small one as well. Like, but, but it's good for learning sort of scratches and stuff because it's basically a mini mixer. It's like a battle mixer almost. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, anything – dude, anything with two channels and a crossfader, do you know what I mean? Like, that's all you need to learn how to scratch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you've got that and are you thinking about doing gigs or are you just playing the music that you want to play? Uh, when I learned how to DJ like through Maddie, you know, when I went there, I was like, oh, I just want to play hip hop and R&B. I just want to play rap music and mm-hmm. all of this. And he was kind of like, well, there's only so many gigs you can get with that. And, you know, like run a mobile DJ company. So like, I'm going to teach you everything. And like really like would quiz me on my like, 80s music, 90s music, like, you know, top hits of all of the eras. So like I was ready to go out and because most of the, I guess, like the clientele from his business was, you know, going out to birthday parties and like kids discos. Weddings. Like, man, most of my like first gig- gigs were like, I was playing kids' discos for years, do you know what I mean? Kids' discos? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the Venga bus and what are you yeah, doing? Like right. that shit of shit. <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> when I first started, I was playing on like CDs. Like I was buying like CDs from Sanity. You weren't burning them. No, I was like, I didn't know any of the tricks. I didn't even know that Record Box existed or, you know, that there was record pools. Like, I was buying all of my music um, on CDs from like Sanity. Like so fresh and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or, like, buying them off iTunes. And, like, that's how I was creating my library. Surely this dude who does mobile DJing could have schooled you on, hey, there is – or he would have all I this think, shit. I and- think um, because, yeah, like, Maddie wasn't using Record Box himself, so he'd just been using CDs. He for, was old school in that. Yeah, Maddie's very old school, era, so he was still yeah. using CDs and stuff, like – um, yeah, I wasn't, I think it was through one of his DJs that had told me about record box. And then I started like for years, man, I was just buying the CDs or buying the tunes and then like putting them on my computer and putting them in a folder and then figuring out the BPM and then putting them in like folders titled 70 to 80 BPM and 80 to 90 BPM. And they were all just going in like ranges of BPM. Yeah. Well, you knew you were close enough. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of just making like a manual record box library. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Even record box is a game changer. For it's me. yeah. And I mean, yeah, I wish I knew about it earlier, but <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> what about, Ser- what about Serato though? Serato I didn't know about like until like four or five years in. Like I really just, man, most of my DJ career has just been like learning as I go. Like I'm not a massive tutorial person. Yep. I don't like people telling me how to do things or like explaining how to do it or just like figuring things out on my own, you know, yeah. so. Okay. So you're on your own journey in that sort of capacity. Uh, yeah, I think thing, it's taken me a little bit longer to figure some things out because yeah. I've just, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't really done any research. But yeah, here I am. So, so you're playing the hip-hop stuff and you're deciding that, okay, so I want to be a hip-hop DJ. So then you look, what are the, the guys that you look up to? I'm guessing they're playing records. You think, all right, well, I've got to get this, make this transition out of digital and even if it is, you know, Digital VS or whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. Is that what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, well, it was. But I didn't, like, I was pretty happy. Man, I was 17. I was 17 playing music in clubs. Like, I was in pretty pain. I was pretty happy with that at that yeah. point. Like, to be honest, I was like, I'm the shit. I'm 17 and I'm DJing in clubs. Yeah. Like, you can't tell me anything, you know? Yeah. But I wasn't doing anything special. Like, I was, I was pretty shit DJ back then. Yeah. And, like, it took me about five years to probably like oh, I wouldn't say like I was decent at mixing and all of that like I mixed and I you know played the right tracks and blah 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 but I wasn't doing like any extra stuff you know and then yeah. it took about four or five years for me to find turntablism mm-hmm. and that's that's when everything had changed yeah. yeah so in that time when you are playing gigs is there many female DJs around the Frio Perth scene um when I first started there wasn't a massive no nah, there wasn't a like if I, if I look back on when I first started I knew one other chick because I started DJing in Mandra. That's where I first started. And like, where's Mandra? Because that's not really in Perth or Freeman. It's further away. It's its own little Yeah, it's there. like an hour out of Perth yeah. south, um, maybe a little bit less. But, yeah, it's towards, you know, Bunbury and yep. further down you go. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a nice coastal town and all that, man. It's like pretty good community there, heaps of young folk. But 
I think when I first started, I only knew like one other chick that DJed in Mandra and she was, I think like 10 years older than me and she was also part of Maddie's crew. Okay. Um, so, so Maddie was running things in Perth. Uh, definitely in Mandra, yeah. He had his crew going and, you know, yeah, man. Yeah, two can and players club. Yeah. yeah. Is that, oh, right. Yeah. So, but it's pretty awesome that your, your stepmom came up with this idea and, and sounded like you were someone who's pretty hard to tame and it kind of ended up being very productive. Yeah, pretty much, man. Like, um, yeah, it definitely saved my life in a way. Really? Yeah, I was, I was de- yeah, I was definitely like veering towards, I was just. On the wrong track. Yeah, I was very much on the wrong track, you know, and I knew I was, and I knew I was meant to be somewhere else, but I was kind of just like, oh, whatever, I'm young and like, you know, just doing dumb shit. But when I hit 17, I was like, fuck, I'm turning 18 soon. Like, I kind of need to become an adult. So, yeah, when my stepmother had called me up and, you know, asked all that stuff, yeah. And you were thankful to her and you said thanks for sort of putting me on this or... 100%, man. I'm still like, yeah, super thankful. Like, yeah. if, yeah, if looking back 10 years ago, like, and to think that it all started with a phone call from my stepmom to be like, have you ever thought of being a DJ? Like, that's pretty wild. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Um, so then on your personal DJ journey, you see turntablism. Where are you, where are you discovering that? On the internet somewhere? Are you seeing it on um, in the flesh? Uh, one of my, my partner at the time, um, he'd sent me a DJ mix. And it was from Craze, DJ Craze and Four Colour Zach. Uh, and it was two cents, like the two cents mix. Yeah. And it was just basically, it was like this whole diss mix towards average DJs. It's just like, <laughs> it's so sick. It's so dope. DJ diss track. Yeah, yeah. It's it's um it's just, you know, showing, yeah, what you can do with the ca- capabilities skill. of DJing and, yeah, turntablism. So that's, yeah, that was my entry point to turntablism. And then I'd, um yeah, like checked out Craze and then I'd seen him doing the Slaves routine. Um. And when I look back on it now, I'm like, uh, it's definitely not one of like crazes, crazier routines. Sounded weird saying that, but <laughs> had to process it. But um, when I first saw it, I was just like, whoa, that's sick. Like I'd, you know, from going just seeing people like mix and, you know, use effects and all that to, you know, like craze using turntables and like doing body tricks and yep. just doing this crazy shit. Um, and the... The angles were great, like the filmography of it was great and just how they put it together and it just like really just pulled me in. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And then that was it, man. So then you go and say, I've got to get get rid of these 400s and get myself some 1200s. Pretty much. I think even at that point, I didn't even have the 400s anymore. Like I think I'd hired them from Maddie for like 20 bucks a week or something <laughs> from my DJ pay. <laughs> <laughs> and then after a while, I was like, no, like I'm getting enough, you know, I'm DJing enough that I'm just, you know, like using equipment enough on weekends that I don't need to practice. Yeah. And I was just kind of done with practicing all the time. But then, yeah, once I'd seen that video, I was like, I need to get some turntables. Yeah. And yeah, I'd gone and um, bought some turntables from Grant at EAV in Perth. I think it was like 1500 for the pair. He'd like powder coated this. Uh, yeah, nice. That's not a bad price. It's a great price, man, honestly. Like, yeah. Yeah, I only sold them last year before I moved over and I sold them to another chick that I taught how to, yeah, oh, awesome. use turntables for. So it was a nice trade-off and for sure. nice send-off for them. But, yeah. yeah, it was pretty hard to, like, let go of me first, you know. Oh, but so then you realise it's just gear, yeah. Yeah, and it's an awesome full-circle moment that you get to pass them on to somebody else who's going to do it, you know? 100%, man. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, because there's not even, I'm guessing, because Perth, I don't think, them, or there might be now, but there's no DJ city or store DJ or anything. That, like you, Hold up. There's a store it? DJ, yeah. There is. Yeah, there's a Manny's. There's always, there's been a store DJ since I can remember. Okay. And they were like a small store in, uh, Huck, Claire, no, not Claremont. So there is, there is somewhere to go buy your shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a good hub there. Yeah, yeah. and okay. the guys are all, like they've always been super helpful. I used to go to store DJ and just like go in there with like twenty problems and be like, "Help me!" Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I just buy shit and yeah, yeah. So then you you get your twelve hundreds. You get in a new mixer. You keep in the four hundred. Nah, no, you got to get rid of the four hundred. Four fifty. Yeah. yeah, I think. Okay. And then I bought an S nine, and then I, you know. And you've got. Your velocity pads, you're, yeah, you're off to the races. Yeah, 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 yeah. everything, man. So, so do you remember when you first started to scratch how you learnt how to do that? Like, are you are you looking at tutorials? Are you just watching crazed videos and trying to mimic it? What are you doing? I wasn't doing nothing. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch tutorials, you know. I said so. Okay. Yeah, I kind of just grabbed my decks out, and yeah, I had like you know all my tracks and shit, and 
I think I downloaded some scratch samples and then I was just trying to like yeah and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, but I wasn't like I didn't I had no idea about how you know you were meant to like move your hands or anything like that. And then I remember for a while I just had the turntables a little bit like I had them and I was kind of just still DJing as if I was using CDJs. Do you know what I mean? Like I just like hit the hot pads and like that would be my cue and I wasn't really using the turntable as the official initial turntable and like instrument it was made for. Yeah. Um, and then my mate Buddha had come around um, one time and been like, what are you doing? Because, yeah, Buddha's been doing it for years and Buddha was, yeah, the guy that taught me how to juggle and like scratch okay. properly. So yeah. like when Buddha came into the picture and was like, you got turntables, but you're not even using the sticker marker on the record and like, so you're using Serato at this stage? Yeah, yeah, I was using yeah. Serato, but I wasn't lining up my hot cues like with the label and yeah. like yeah, I just still didn't you know It was like internal mode sort of when Yeah, it was just still basically, yeah. yeah, just on mix mode. I wasn't really like fully manipulating anything or grabbing the record. But once once Buddha to like basically showed me that, that just completely changed everything. Yep. Yeah. And then he taught you the basics and then you just taught yourself because that seems to be how you want to learn how to do things. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like showed me um yeah, how to, you know, like just basic baby scratches and, you know, like manipulation of the record and how to hold, you know, the record and um having my hand in the sweet spot and even like taught me how to stand comfortably in between the decks because you'd think like anyone you know you just you just stand in front of the decks right but like even I found with my students like they'll get to the deck and if they're going to scratch on the left deck they'll stand right in front of the left deck yeah. when like you need to be in the middle Central. of a mixer man yeah. yeah like there and just yeah taught me how to like relax my body into it and even one day like you know and this is something I'll still say to my students is like I remember him saying think of your arm as an extension of the record okay. and that just hell stuck with me like yeah. the way that you're yeah, it is. As soon as like that that record is on the deck, that that is an extension of your body. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So then you're learning to scratch. Are you putting together routines? Uh, so baby scratch, baby steps. Baby scratch, baby steps. Yeah, and then I went to Buddha's one time. Needed some help with my library. I'd like corrupted all my files. Yeah, that used to happen a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know, you just you put shit somewhere and then you move it and you I don't know, you rename it. I don't know. It's just bad library management, you know. Take so, it off the desktop and it's fucking move it in somewhere and then it doesn't know where. Pretty it is. much, but you're just not meant to move it, man. You know that's kind of how coding. Good management goes. is a key to that sort of shit. Massive key to it, man. Even now, look at my laptop. I'm like, you know, I've got to do some, like, probably a whole week of just, like, library management of, like, cutting down a whole lot of stuff in there and just reorganisation because, yeah, it just gets a bit out of hand. But, yeah, I went over there, had some problems with files and, um, yeah, saw Buddha, like, juggling. I didn't know what it was at the time, but, yeah, mm. it was beat juggling. And I was like, what is he doing, yeah. you know? And I'm like, just stand there. What are you doing? He's like beat juggling. I'm like, okay, like, you know, and yeah, it taught me how to beat juggle. And I was standing there. I was there with my mate Russ. I remember, and he was, well, both of us were like, this is crazy. And he's like, all right, one of you stand on this deck, and one of you stand on the other deck. And he was just trying to get us to do just one half of the juggle. You know what I mean? Which would be hard because not only are you trying to get it right, you've mm. got to be in fucking well, you sync with that. Yeah, person. you got to trust the other person, right? <laughs> but it's pretty easy because you just go, all right, when it's your turn, you grab the crossfader. And you drop the track. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much all you got to do. And then when they grab the crossfader, you got to rewind it back and be ready to drop it on your turn. You know, but even just having that like split, like I think that was just a great like intro to it. And we were so so he knew what he was doing by teaching you like that. He knew that this would help you. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like was yeah, he's um yeah definitely like a master of it. He's been doing it for a long time. Yeah, yeah for sure. really look up to him. So yeah, taught me um how to juggle. And after that, I was like so hooked. Like, yeah. I love juggling. Like, definitely more than. Definitely more than scratching. There's yeah. just something about it, like, I don't know. And, you know, adding body tricks and all that. Like, once I learned how to do body tricks. so But it taught me how to juggle. And then, um, yeah, after – I think I'd been juggling for, like, a few weeks. And then, um, yeah, me and Buddha were living together at the time. He'd ended up moving in. Well, we had a spare room. I was like, yeah, come live with us, man. I live with me and my cousin. And, um, yeah, one day in the hallway, it was like – you should enter DMC this year because they just released, you know, like DMC entries and I was like, nah. And it didn't take much, you know, I was just, I was like, nah, I'm not going to do it. And he's like, you should do it. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, I'll do it, you know. Yeah. And so 
that then gives you a, a deadline. So you're like, well, I've got to come yeah, up with Yeah, I had six weeks, man. You know, I had six weeks to yeah. like put and together a routine. you'd never been to the DMC or a competitive I'd been to one. I'd, I'd gone to the DMC the year before. Mm-hmm. Um, after I'd like found turntablism and I bought my turnies and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this and then, yeah, started learning like to use them properly and then juggling and then, yeah, six weeks and it was just a matter of like, yeah, Buddha helped me put this whole routine together and, yeah, like trained me on like how to make a routine and like you know taught me new cuts and like how to make combos and everything, man. Like, so I'm guessing this changes the whole way that you approach DJing now because you're gonna have to make edits as well, aren't you? Like within the files like are you using or you just take the actual song and cut do you know what i mean yeah so with dmc like what you'll do is you'll make like a battle record for it or mm-hmm. like a cut track for it or you know battle track whatever you want to call so that like all your samples are on the same record or this or that yeah so you have to make like less changes so yeah once you figure out your routine and what you're doing and like get that all down pat then you're like all right like, let's put this on a record or like on one track, track yeah. or two, and then we only have like only have to move the record. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. and then you've got to use Ableton or something like that. To yeah. Then you have to use Ableton. Yeah. 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 And even then, like, I didn't know how to use Ableton. So like, Buddha and um, Bass Cadet as well. Like they'd both like give me tips in the past on like how to like put together those and mm-hmm. yeah. So that was your foray into using Ableton the first time you did, did that. Yeah, that would have been yeah the first time you used Ableton as well. Yeah, it was making stuff for DMC. <laughs> yeah. Did you, was it hard to get your head around? Um, well, I guess like because you know we were really just doing it to make the track for yeah. DMC. It was just like all right, you know, no one was really worried about like teaching me how to use Ableton or anything like They're that. Just like you just need this sound. Here. Yeah, yeah. It's just like we're making this cut track. Like boom, boom, boom. It's like do you understand? And I was like, yep. <laughs> but like you know. Yeah. I still got to go in and like re-understand it because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty basic though. It's like, you know, you put it on the, the third pass of every, you know, four. Yeah. Like put it on the yeah, first yeah, yeah. beat and then the lands on the third and then the next one on the first so that it's on every rotation yep. or like. And yeah. then if you miss one, you can hit the hot cue, which will bring it back there. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like you've that. always got hot cues and stuff, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so then well, I couldn't – I've never done anything like that, but I couldn't even imagine where you'd begin to, like, craft something like that because the like, the ideas are endless. Like how do you even nail down what you want to do? I mean, to be honest, at the time I didn't – because it was my first year – like, I didn't even have any ideas, you know what I mean? I was like, what I don't, What am I going to... I don't know what to do, you know? Like, Buddha had come up with a lot of, like, the... Yeah, given me a lot of the material to work with and been like, oh, yeah, this this would suit you for a battle, you know? So I think after that first year, I was like, okay, now I... What year was that? ...have an idea. That was 2019. Yeah. Yeah, in the state WA and I um, think... And you had... you Is that the one where you had, like, a lot of female samples in it, though? Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. my only, like, that was my first DMC and that was the only one I ever did live because yep. then 2020 we had yeah. COVID and then we were online. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then I was battling online for, like, two years. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was the one that I'd used, like, heaps of female samples and yeah. I'd used, like, the um, Kill Bill sample and, yeah. yeah, all that. The intro there, yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't even – so when did the name – when did you come up with the name? When was that? Mishap? Yeah. Um. How far uh, along the journey? Well, Mishap, Mishap was a rebrand. Um, fuck, my Come first, on, tell us what your yeah, original name was. Oh, God, it's so cringy. Um, my first DJ name was J Blitz. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is not that bad. Uh, like, yeah, but you're <laughs> laughing, do you know what I mean? It's not that bad, but... Uh, yeah, J Blitz I'd like picked because I was like, oh, it sounds kind of like hip-hop and R&B and like my name's Jess and... Blitz means to like amaze someone, but it also means to get stoned, you know. And I was like, yeah, J Blitz. And after a few years, I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I'll just call myself Blitz. And then I was like, and then I remember going to a family dinner one time. This is so embarrassing, but <laughs> <laughs> this is so embarrassing. I've really only told this to like close friends, and now I'm saying it on a podcast. I might tell you to delete it later, but. Um, yeah, and my auntie had said, oh, what's your DJ name? J Clits. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> J Clits? Yeah. So I was like, i got to change this. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And then, yeah, that prompted mishap. Was she taking the piss or she actually thought that's what it was? I think she was taking the piss. Okay. But 
Who knows? Either way, you've got her to thank for coming up with a pretty cool name, though. Yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah, if you look at it that way, Arnie Haley <laughs> pushed me to rebrand to Mishap. And I think it's definitely a better name. <laughs> it so. is. And I'm guessing it's sp- inspired by sort of Missy Elliott and the misdemeanor sort of thing. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely got um, yeah massive influence from Missy and, yeah, really, really look up to her in a lot of ways. But um, that actually – that name came from my sister. Like, I remember just sitting down with her one day and I was like, I've got, I got to change this DJ name, you know. <laughs> And she's like, oh, all right, let's try to come up with names. And, you know, she doesn't know much about hip hop. Like, she's not really in, like, the DJ scene or anything like that. Like, she's a pretty big, you know, indie rocker, like, mm-hmm. yeah, hippie gal. But, um, yeah, it was just brainstorming names and was looking at, like, like my middle name's Marie. So she was trying to come up with all these, like, you know. And then, yeah, she just came up with Mishap and, yeah. yeah. There you go. The rest is history. The rest is history, man. No more J Blitz. No more J Blitz. I'm going to push for us to not take that story out because it's fucking awesome. Oh, yeah, that's fine. You can keep it in. You can keep it in. <laughs> so so I, I should have asked about the, the mishap thing earlier. But anyway, um, yeah, Missy Elliott, man, she was like pretty ahead of her time, I reckon. I think, yeah, she's, she's always going to be – I feel like she's always going to be ahead of her time. And just pushed boundaries and just didn't give a fuck. And I really liked that, like – I really, yeah, still like that. You know, I've I've definitely struggled with like being trying to push into boxes or this or that or like sexualize myself. And Missy was very like, I'm doing whatever the fuck I want, mm. and that's yeah, definitely what I'm about. Yeah, no hate on the newer female rappers, but they overly sexualize it. Where Missy Elliott was just like, I'm gonna rap, and you can call me a girl or whatever, but I'm just a rapper, you know? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, like, and that's the same thing. Like, I've you know, like, um. I'll own being called a female DJ or whatever, but I would rather just be, you know, like it's like seeing, you know, all those rap lists or like top 50 rap tracks or whatever. It's like, and then, you know, there's one whole category for like top 50 hip hop and then it's like top 50 female hip hop. And it's like, why are we even, you know, but at the same time when it's like an additional category, uh, I kind of like can see, you know, where they're going with it. It's like, mm trying to shine a light on the women. But yeah. sometimes you can kind of see it as like a, a I don't know. Thing. Yeah, depends how you want to view it. Yeah, some, depends yeah. how you want to view it, you know. Like if you give it power and you're like, yeah, like we're female rappers, we're female DJs. Like I'm a DJ, just just a DJ. Like I don't DJ with any of my like female parts, so I don't see how that makes <laughs> me a female DJ. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like we don't call these blokes like man DJs, we just call them DJs. Yes, and that is an awesome segue because with the DMCs, there's no female category. It's just DMCs. And that's how it should be. Exactly. Well, yeah. And that's that's the thing. So when you decide you want to do it, is it daunting? You think, all right, oh, well, there's no other females here. Was there any other females that have, have done it in that category? Well, what, what, well, there's no category. Yeah, there's like... In WA. The, yeah, in the online, so there's like, you know, heaps of categories. Like when I was battling online, there was definitely a few more women. Um, that I realised. And there's, there's heaps of women battling in, like, uh, you'll see a few battling in, like, UK, Japan, yep. um, a- America and all that. But there's definitely less in Australia. Like, yeah, fuck. Uh, D, D, DJ D, Sydney. I can't think of, like, many other women competing in mm-hmm. yeah, Australian DMCs. So it's just it's good to just... See any women doing it, you know? Yeah. And were people reasonably welcoming? Was that because there's no female category? They're just like, yep, we've got a female DJ. This is cool, you know? Yeah, 100%. Like, I remember the first year I did it um, in 2019 in Perth, um, Mick Shane, who's a rapper and he was hosting. Um, yeah, um, was working at. At store DJ at the time as well, so I think I knew Max Shane through store DJ. But yeah, it was even when he'd introduced me. You know, he was like, "I don't think this has happened before," but like, you know, we've got our first like lady contender in the building, and you know, everyone like really cheered and like gave me a good welcome. So no, I don't think. I think within the turntable scene, it's pretty, it's pretty welcoming. You know, like if you're gonna be a female DJ, it's hard enough, but to then like, yeah, I guess be entering a realm of you know. Another realm further into DJing where, like, you're already, I guess, told as a female that you don't belong in a DJ world. Like, to be entering the turntablism world at, like, I don't know. Yeah, in a way, man, sometimes takes a bit of balls. Like, that, after that, like, first battle, like, I didn't even take a video of that. I didn't take the footage. So this guy called Timmy, Timmy Hugs. It's like, I found it online. I checked yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah. so he, he put the footage up and he must have removed the comments, but it took a while because... 
there was like nasty comments on there, man. Really? What, yeah. Like, like derogatory because you're female. Oh uh, yeah, like I don't know, like fat old blokes in UK like hating on me for yeah, like being a girl, y- being what? a girl for using a laptop. Like I'm like, it's 2019. Yeah. Everyone's using a laptop. Do you know what I mean? But they, I don't know, I don't even know where they came from. But at the time, man, I was like. I, I'd spent six weeks, like, every single day working on this thing yeah. and, like, pushed it pretty hard. And I'd taken out third place, you know. And yep. even one of them was, like, I got a random message from some dude being, like, wow, third place, what an achievement. And I was, like... Fuck you. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Like, did you enter, my friend? Like, yeah. you know, it's just, um, yeah. But nowadays, like, if I get any of that, man, I just, like, have fun with them back, you know. Like, some guy, like, on, a, on one of the online ones was, like, oh, no, a girl DJ. And I was, like... What does that even mean? Yeah, I was like, oh, hi, like, it's Max, are you a boy DJ? DJ yeah. Yeah, it was just, it's just, I don't know, you just have to really laugh at it because it doesn't make any sense at all. Like, no. Yeah. And I, I feel like, I don't know, yeah, in a way, like, yeah, you can kind of see it as, like, people just being mad that, like, I don't know. It's spawned from jealousy, most likely, I'd say. Yeah, or just people were just hating on their own lives, man, and, like, their own, like, lack of success or, like, um, their own fears that have crushed them. Like, you know, you just can't let it get to you. Like, I definitely used to, sh- like, let things get to me a lot more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I guess maturity comes, you realise you don't feed the trolls and that sort of thing and just let them fucking go. Yeah, pretty much, man. Yeah. Make friends with them. Be nice to them. They hate Kill it. Kill with kindness. Yeah, they hate it. They yeah. really do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, so it's interesting because you were welcomed by the actual community, but then you cop in some hate online from people, and I guess you're going to get that in anything, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you come in any, any artistic pursuit, people are going to hate on you. Anything, man. There's always going to be people sitting at home, like, in their really dirty, shitty house that they hate, like, yeah. you know, trying to hate on your stuff because they don't like their life. Yeah, it's like... I could have done that, and you're like, but you didn't, you know? Yeah, you didn't. You didn't. I did do it, so why are you hating on me? Yeah, you, you didn't. Yeah. Exactly the point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't get it. Um, so the online thing, look, everything went online 2020, 2021, basically. Yeah. Um, whether we liked it or not, for obvious reasons. But I feel like that DJ stuff, it, it, it lent itself pretty good to online, you know? Yeah, it did really well, man. Like, people were using Twitch to, like, do live streaming and all of that. Like, I... It almost pushed you into tutorials. Almost. Almost. Oh, uh, almost. Almost. But I didn't. Did I didn't take the bait. No, no I should have. I should have definitely used that time to, yeah, do all of that. Like, I had, like, when COVID first hit, I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I'm going to go get a job, you know? When most people were like, oh, I'm going to take this doll money. I was like, fuck, I don't want to get on the doll. Because you don't want to do what you're told to do. That's yeah, right. yeah, pretty much. It was a whole a whole lot of that. So, yeah, I went out and made it harder for myself. And then, like, months later, I was like, oh, I probably should have just enjoyed this time and learned some new skills and stuff. But, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so you're competing online in the DMCs. And there, you said there's different categories. So what were the online different categories that were different to the Oh, there stuff? are so many, man. Really? Like, yeah. I can't even, can't even think of it. Like... There was, I think, like, three different portableist categories and, you know, like, like there was, you know, scratch category and then there was the beat juggling and then there was the traditional DMC and then there was, like, yeah, fuck, there were so many. I feel like there was, like, 50 categories. Right. Someone will correct, correct me because I'm definitely wrong. Wrong. <laughs> but there was a lot of categories, you know, yeah. and it just, it was really good for, I think, just keeping the scene engaged and the community and the culture alive and... Yeah keep people yeah like working and being creative but at the same time it's like fuck you could you could win like five dmc titles in one year and be like oh yeah i was the portal portablest champ the scratch champ the beat juggle champ do you know what i mean like at what yeah. point does it not take away from yeah i was the dmc champion of australia Which, this year yeah that is yeah you know? one category one winner one category one winner like yeah. you're the one. Yeah, it's like Michael Phelps winning 15 different medals for swimming when it's just different categories of the same swimming. Yeah, you're just the best swimmer, man. Yeah, you know just I mean? be good at swimming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so did did that make you think about what the way you DJ, though, when you when there's all these different categories? Or you just like – because you love your juggling, obviously, but are you like, all right, well, I, I want to focus on a certain certain kind here? Well, yeah, I love, the, I love juggling. So I entered the beat juggling champs uh, in 21. I think it was the last year. 
last year I entered 2020, 2021. Yeah, that was the last year I entered. And um, yeah, I, I didn't get very far with that at all, man. I think I entered and there was like 100, 108 contestants worldwide. It was like worldwide beat juggling. Whoa, yeah. That's different to Perth. <laughs> very different to Perth. Yeah, and very different to even doing it, yeah, Australia-wide. Um, so, yeah, I'd entered the Australian Nationals uh, online, 2020. 2020? Yeah. And I uh, made the top 10, but I think I scraped in at, like, 10. And that was out of 17 contestants. Right. And then the next year, yeah, I decided I'd enter the beat juggling, and I did not even get close. I don't even know, you know, if anyone even watched me video. Actually, they must have, because it didn't make it, but... You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, well. but It doesn't matter. Like, I entered and, I, I, you know, even, like, I don't know if you know who DJ Pearly is, but, mm. yeah, she's based in the US and, like, she's wild, man. She's And it, even then, it's like I got to enter a battle and I, you know, was in the same battle as Pearly and, like, a whole bunch of other DJs that are, like, world class. Like, I watch them and I'm like, they're fucking dope. So to not even be put on the yeah. numbers, it's like, well. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. So, but the world's starting to open up again, so you're getting back to DJing in clubs and stuff, that sort of thing? Yeah, man, yeah, 100%. Like, I think, yeah, since, you know, all the lockdowns lifted and, I mean, I only moved here seven months ago, so I don't, you know, I wasn't really here for all of that. But, um, yeah, it was pretty open in Perth. Like, we yeah. had it pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I feel like people are coming out more and more now and, I don't know, the was, scene's constantly changing. Was in Perth when you were doing your your gigs post-COVID, are the turntables at venues or they got CDJs? Like, is there ways for you to it's mostly take your flex your skills in the clubs? It's mostly CDJs. Um, there's turntables, like there's turntables at Henry's Summer, but I don't use them on the Sundays um, just because I'd be doing like club nights on the Fridays and Saturdays and they weren't really good for the club. But most of the venues you go to in Perth are, yeah, mostly CDJs, unless they're like small bars in Frio or Leaderville or, yeah. you know, things like that. Like, mm -hmm. they're still accessible. But, yeah, most of the time... Like, I've played on CDJs most of my life. And you can do the same stuff. You can do on turntables on CDJs, man. But just can't really juggle on them that well. Like, some people can, but I can't. Yeah, yeah. You, you need, like, the the rain controllers with the movable platter. Yeah, thing. I think – I feel like the platter just needs – yeah, the fact that the platter's not moving is, like, what changes the beat juggling, I feel. I've got some Technic CD players. You remember them? And nah, the platter moves, man. That's wild. Yeah. They never really took off. I wonder why. They weren't pioneer, but they also you could have memory cards back then to put songs on them when the like this is like when CDJ one thousands came out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can still put like SD card like memories memory cards in. But you couldn't back then on the pioneer ones. True. Yeah. Oh, maybe the one thousands you could. Just, what does that really add though? You know what I mean? Because well, you've the got the platter sp spun though. Oh uh, yeah, the platter spinning is cool, but yeah. the media card thing, it's like you know because you've already got a USB slot. Why do you need a media card? Well, but the first, I think the 1000 Mark II or three or whatever they were, they had the memory cards but no USBs. The C, the USBs didn't come in until like the 4th, hundreds, I think. Yeah. But what's the – the memory card's just another USB slot, isn't it? Pretty much. And it's a great way for you to leave all your shit at a club because yeah. you can't see it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I never used them. I used them – well, I used it once and then I left it there and then never used one again. Never get, yeah. Um, so you've got to think, I guess, long term, are you thinking I'm going to move to somewhere over east because that's what people love saying in WA? They love saying it, they yeah. They love saying it. You're and people east. hate on people for saying it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're going to move to Melbourne, are you? And you're like, yeah. And if you don't do it, then like it looks even worse, you know? <laughs> so so did, you, did you know it was always going to be Melbourne? Did you toy with the idea of Sydney? Like, uh. I've always, yeah, I've always liked Melbourne. Like, we lived here when I was younger, but I don't remember it much. And then I've come here, like, a few times over the years and just always really enjoyed it. Um, and, yeah, I think it's, honestly, man, like, I think one of the biggest things I love is just everywhere I look, there's, like, graph and everything just looks so colourful. Even and in podcast studios. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just, like, so distracted right now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'd always, like, known that I'd live somewhere else, but I just didn't know. Yeah. You know, where it would be. Like, even, like, thought about living in Europe or, like, Japan would be dope. But yep. I do like Australia. Like, I I find it pretty hard. When you leave Australia and you go on holiday and then you, you're like, fuck, we got it really good back home. Yeah. And I miss, like, just having a barbie and chilling out. Like, I know that sounds real simpleton, but I don't know. Yeah. 
Huge turntablist culture over in Japan, though, isn't it? They There's are. massive, man. And they're wild. They're so wild. Like, any any comp you enter and someone from Japan entering, just know that you probably don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> they're just good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they love the hip-hop culture in general, breaking, all that sort of shit. Yeah. But and that's yeah. one thing I didn't sort of mention. So when you got into hip hop, you got it straight into the DJ side of it. The graph, the breaking, the MCing, was that something that you, you messed around with? Uh the graph and the breaking, no, but yeah, I've I've been writing raps since I was like like probably eight, man, you know. Yeah. Like haven't really started doing anything with them until recently. But yeah. yeah, I've always like, you know, written like poems and lyrics and like raps and yeah, always wanted to rap. So yeah, when I was in high school I'd like you know, write like little bars with my mates or, you know, try to spit some, but yeah, never really like, I think it t it's taken me until recently to like just really find my voice and as well like know my rhythm and understand like my rhythm and even like be able to use that to try to make beats, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, it's like I was saying before, like when I was younger, I tried to, you know, hit that drum pad of my brothers and like there was, there was no natural rhythm there. But like after all these years of DJing, it's just like. You found your you know. Yeah, yeah, I think it just, it's exactly like how it's needed to go, you know, so. Perth's cool, Fremantle's great, but I guess an aspiring DJ slash performer has to get out of Perth at some stage to do some other stuff. Yeah, I think so, man. Like, now I'm here, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I wish I'd, like, gotten out of my comfort zone a bit earlier, you know? Like, I'd always been saying, you know, yeah, I want to travel with music and I want to, like, tour the world with DJing, but, you know, I want to make sure I'm ready first and, like, do all these things first, you know, like, release music. And, you know, it was kind of just like I always had to get something done before I made the move, but yeah. I think just making the move makes you get stuff done. Jump in the deep end. Pretty much, man. I'm, pretty, I'm very much like that these days. Uh, Casey, uh, my DJ school partner, had said that to me the other day, being like, you know... Me and you are very different, Jay. Like, I don't realise that the more I speak to you, but you very much, like, just jump and, yep. you know, you'll find a landing. <laughs> and I'm very, like, you know, I've got to figure out the landing. Yeah. But I haven't always been that way. And I think just the more that I have just decided to take the leap and yeah. just do stuff, it, yeah, it works. So you mentioned the DJ school stuff. Were you doing yeah. that in Perth before you came here? Yeah, I was working for a school, Lab 6, um, back in Perth, yep. I was working for them for a while, but over COVID, um, I'd called up Casey and I'd basically just, yeah, because I didn't really know what to do for income, man, and I was like kind of stressing out about how I'd go about it, and I thought I'd like teach people how to DJ over COVID. Yep. I called Casey up, and he'd been running the school for like years, like 30 years in Sydney, um, and he'd kind of given me this whole like, oh, you don't want to do it, man, like super stressful and this and that. How hard Lovely. could it be teaching people how to uh, DJ? How it's not that hard. It's just the whole like running the school thing and, okay. you know. The like, admin shit. Yeah, the admin stuff, I yeah. think. And just dealing with all of that. And um, yeah, it can be, you know, like a bit of a challenge in some ways. But at the time, I was just wanting to like do one-on-one -on -one lessons. And I was also wanting to run workshops, though. So I had this whole idea of like running, you know, women's turntables and workshops and really wanted to do that. Um, and then, yeah, after a couple of weeks, I'd gotten a call from Lab 6. And, yeah, they wanted me to come be one of the instructors there. So, yeah, I went and talked with those guys for a bit. And then... Um, is it turntable stuff or is it DJing, like, with CDJs or a bit of everything? It's a full, like, 10-week course and yep. it's, like, covers everything from, like, the beginning to turntablism. But mm -hmm. it's pretty, you know, like, yeah, the basics of DJing. And uh, it's a very well-run course. But I definitely found that when I got to the, the week of turntablism that that was when... Yeah, I was, like, most ignited, you know. Like, I can teach people how to use CDJs and stuff and, like... Yeah. You, you know, want to get to the good stuff. DJ, but, yeah, like, I'd rather... I'd prefer to be, like... I don't know, man. There's, like, different ways I view it because, you know, I really enjoy just, like, teaching, like, showing people the world of DJing and, like, I feel like it should be very accessible and, like, accessible to anyone, you know. If you want to play music, you play music, man. Like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not anyone to say, like... It needs to be done like in this way or that way or that way. Like it should be free for all, you know. Yeah. So I think like being able to teach DJing as a basic concept and that whole fundamental is great. But I do know that like my passion lies in turntablism, and I always felt that way. Like any time I teach turntablism, I'm just so amped up. So yeah, yeah. And it's cool full circle moments when you get to teach people because you remember, I guess, when 
Buddha and these other people have taught you and you're like, I can pass on the fucking knowledge. That's yeah. a lot of what hip-hop's about. Yeah, man, exactly it. So, yeah, I think, I think like, you know, I feel like when I am teaching, like, the full courses and all, like, I'm, as I said, I really do love it. But, yeah, sometimes you are a bit like, fuck, you know, like, it's pretty... Now that I've been doing it for 10 years, I do feel like, you know, DJing in itself, like, without adding the turntablism is, like, pretty easy. And I, yep. I find it hard to... I think my biggest challenge with teaching is has been finding a way to simplify it and actually just really do the most, like, you know, this is how you do an intro, outro mix mm -hmm. and, like, not add any extra stuff. Like, I used to do demonstrations to new students and be like, this is how you do a mix and then just, like, boom, 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 boom and do, like, you know, add effects and, like, yeah. add scratches and they'd be like... That's too much for us to comprehend. <laughs> yeah. You know, can you explain what you uh, did? And yeah. then I wouldn't be able to explain it. So I think just... You know, and I remember, um, uh, yeah, we were chilling with Deno one day, me and Grills, and he'd said, like, it's because he teaches as well, and he yeah. was saying it's a different part of your brain that, like, accesses the information and knows how to do it compared to that that knows how to explain it. Yeah. And so, it, like, you really have to move the information from that one part to the other and yeah, it's learn like how to articulate. Yeah, the analytical part and the creative part. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Left yeah. and right brain type stuff. Yeah, so I definitely, like, you know, I didn't really do much theory or, like, I've never done music theory. I've never, like, yeah. done much by the book or, like, I don't watch tutorials and I don't like, you know, learning the analytical side and I just like doing it in the creative way and so that's why I think I don't know or I'm still learning how to, yeah, it, make it, it analytical. If it works for you, it works for you, but I guess the challenge is there that if you have to teach other people, what works for you may not work for them. Exactly, So yeah. then you have to get the uh, analytical side of it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's something I'm learning now. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I guess that helps you progress as well because when you start to look at sound waves and look at and think about it differently and, and, and approach it like that, does, has that helped your DJing as well? Yeah, it definitely has, man. Like even, I don't know, you know, with the... I guess over the years of having like feedback or criticism or um, people asking me to, yeah, like certain venues asking me to scratch less or this and that and really having to like think about what I'm doing because most of the time I'm not really thinking, I'm just, I'm just doing it and yep. like feeling it out and just kind of like, you know, I don't know, man. So sometimes they say, oi, take it easy. Yeah, 100%. Some clubs just aren't, yeah, like they're not. I guess they're just not there to watch DJ shredded or like perform or like be a turntablist. They just want to like dance to music that's continuously going. More and Drake. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and as yeah, like a dedicated turntablist, sometimes it is like a bit of a, it feels like a bit of a punch in the gut or a slap in the face. We like, damn, like, you know, I'm doing all this. They don't want me to do all this. You know, yes, you yeah. could see it as like a way to do an easy job, or you could see it as fitting in a box and going another way. But yeah. The thing is, if you don't do anything extra. There's a fair bit of time in between mixing songs. That what are you going to do? Dance around? Fuck, I don't know, man. <laughs> I guess what I used to do, but I, yeah, that's pretty much like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I find now that if, yeah, I'm being told like not to do anything between the tracks, I'm like, uh, yeah. I'm, that's, yeah. It's not, how, it's not really how I operate, you know. It's not like how I like to operate, but sometimes you just got to do the job. Which is strange because I normally think if you've got someone who has the skill set to fucking do some cool stuff, you'd go, yeah, how about it? Do that, you know what I mean? Be busier on the decks, don't do less. That's my train of thought. That's, that's definitely my train of thought, but it's, you know, it's not how the world works. I guess not everyone <laughs> thinks the same. So. so let's get back on your journey to move to Melbourne. So you've decided you're going to leave east, no, west, go east. Yeah. And then you've told your family, friends are going to do it. You decide you're coming to Melbourne. Yeah. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. Go do it. Uh, most people were like, don't do it. <laughs> really? Because they've <laughs> never left Perth? Um, maybe a bit of that. Um, a bit of like, you know, I feel like maybe some of my mates just like didn't want me to leave and not come back because they probably like saw that happening. But um, I you think, you know, Perth, like, though, don't you? A little bit from an artist perspective. Yeah, dude, definitely. Like, I love Perth. It's always going to be home. Um, it did a lot for me. Like, I spent 10 years there as a DJ and four of those full time. And, like, yeah, I learned a lot there. But, yeah, compared to, like, the amount of opportunity that's in other cities or the amount of effort or time that people are willing to put into you is astronomical because, yeah, I guess coming from Perth, people are like, yeah, you're a dope DJ in Perth. 
but it's going to cost us X amount to get you here and X amount to get you here. And uh, we can't afford to fly you everywhere all the time. So you're just a dope DJ in Perth. Do you know what I mean? And you'd really just kind of get left there a lot of the time because, yeah, you know, I think like you don't have to leave Perth to make it. I don't think that at all. But I do think that you have to leave your comfort zone to get close to making it. And Perth definitely was a comfort zone for me. Like I was just like, oh, I'm making my money. Like I'm, I was making like, good money to pay my mortgage and pay my rent and pay my bills and even save money. So I was like, yeah, you know. Yeah. But Com- safe, comfortable. Pretty safe and comfortable, yeah. Like, So I had to, for a while there, it really was like, oh, well, you know, why move somewhere else and be struggling for money and like this and that. But at some point it really did reach um, that kind of thought process of like, man, I don't have time to waste. Like, I really don't. And money comes and goes, you know. Like, yeah. For sure. So then you take the leap, you come to Melbourne, where do you land? What's the first thing? You're reaching out to people. Do you know where you're going? Have you got gigs lined up? Yeah, so I did like four trips over here last year to, you know, kind of like make some groundwork and meet people and network and all of that. So I was like, missions. Yeah, I was already like planning it and yep. like mapping it out. Um, and before I did all of that, I was DJing like the Dave Chappelle uh, after party in Perth. I think of like... That's sick. Did you meet him? No, he didn't rock up, but his whole crew was there, like, um, you know, his support comedian Marshall, Marshall Brandon, or uh, I think it was Marshall Brandon's story, I actually don't know. But, yeah, Marshall, um, and then Trauma, DJ Trauma, who's his tour DJ, and then LJ, um, who was with them on the tour. And so I'd met LJ, um, and he'd kind of, like, connected me with people here and told MJ, who runs 100% Fat, about me, and then, yeah, MJ had, like, Signed me up to his roster and all of that. So I'm part of that crew now. And, um, yeah, good, kind good of just crew, like... Good crew. Really good crew, man. Yeah, like, there's... Yeah, they're all dope DJs and really good people. And MJ takes good care of me. So it's been good, man. Like, I've had, yeah, really good support. And then, like, during those shows as well, like, I played at the de- the, the dojo mm-hmm. um, on one of those trips. And that's how I met the Break and Bread crew. And so, yeah, I've, like, I've just... Yeah, got really good support around me here, man. Yeah. I've yeah. known MJ for... 25 years, I reckon. I tried to get yeah. him on the show. True. Uh, early days, and I've never been able to get him on because he doesn't fucking drive, and this is way too far for him. Ah, <laughs> you need to get tea on it. You need to get tea on the road. Yeah. No, I'll get – no, I've known MJ for a long time. He's a good dude, and I'd love to get him, to get him on. But he does – yeah, he's got a great crew of people, awesome DJs. Hijack's coming on soon when he's Dope. back from, from Bali. Yep. Uh, and a few other people. So, yeah, we love MJ. Yeah, man, we do. Um, he's, a, he's a stable part of the Melbourne – club scene especially from that hip-hop sort of perspective yeah 100 percent, 100 percent, and um yeah definitely like nurtures that part of me and you know like yeah puts me on a section when there's like you know the 100 percent fat gigs and we always have a great time so yeah yeah good on you mj we'll get you down here one day um yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned breaking bread and that you've seemed to have slotted into that family pretty well tell yeah. us how that came about how you met those guys and uh yeah um, so I met those guys at the dojo on the last night that we had the dojo. It was like the Wu-Tang night mm-hmm. and Wu-Tang were in town. Um, so yeah, I'd hit those guys up, uh, seeing if they'd need like someone to DJ and they already had someone DJing, but said I could like come and spin some stuff. I was like, fuck yeah. So yeah, went down and was like, I'm going to do my thing. And, um, yeah, I met fuck, like most of the crew there that night. Um, I don't remember like too much of it i just remember it being like not because i was drunk but just because it was a bit of like a blur a blur there was a lot going on um but i remember i'd met shinen from there and then shinen had told t about me um i'm sure t was there as well but he'd said like come and have a meeting at fat um and let's talk because yeah shinen had teamed me up and been like you need to be my dj and i was like yeah i'm your (laughs) dj you know like um, so yeah, I'd gone and have a, had a meeting at Fat, like the last time I was here in Melbourne and, you know, Shannon was saying like, yeah, Jess is going to move here and, you know, like T, Miss Hap, this and that. And, um, T was like, all right, so you're definitely moving. And I was like, yep, I'll be here in four months. And he was like, all right, like, well, when you know you're moving, I was like, I'm definitely moving, man, you know? So yeah. Yeah. When they knew I was coming down with like, we already had the, um, Legends show planned and all of that. So it was kind of like. Just knew I had to be here for that date. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, got to Melbourne and, yeah, had, like, a fat dinner and met all the crew for the, the gig and then just, like, ran heaps of rehearsals and then had the night and, like, that was, yeah, that was it, man. That was the start of it. 
And was there a, an official ceremony where T said, you're now part of the family? Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I feel like it was definitely, it was probably definitely from Legends. So I could think just from that night, yeah. T was just like, yeah, yeah you're, you're my on. DJ now. You're, so. you're on. Yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and so, because I'm guessing stuff happens in Perth, but I'm guessing stuff like that, kind of family like that, as soon as you move over here, it must be pretty welcoming and kind of cool. Oh, dude, 100%. Yeah, like I, yeah, I count my blessings every day for it, man. Like I'm very blessed to have been like welcomed with, yeah, such welcoming arms and like so much love. Um, yeah, like I've, I spent my whole life in Perth, man, and I've never like had a community around me to this degree, you know, like probably the biggest, like, yeah, family I had away from my family back home was like our little turntablism crew. And mm-hmm. like that was, you know, hard leaving. Like we had our DMC and I was like, yeah, I'm leaving, you know, I'm not going to be here anymore. And everyone was like, fuck man, like, you're going to be part of the Melbourne scene now, you know? Like, yeah. Go on then. Go you know, on, go over east. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm super blessed with it. Yeah, for sure. And the, now that you're here and, you, and you're doing cool stuff, are people from, from home going, man, that's awesome. We're going to come over, visit. We want to check it out. We're seeing all this cool shit. Like, we want to come experience it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, my, you know, both sets of parents come over. Like, my mum came to visit for my birthday and I recently had my dad and my stepmom over and they came to the Breaking Bread crew gig. And, yep. yeah, for them to, like, see, yeah, what's going on for me here and like see me in my element and see me with my other family and you know see like how just how good it is and how I don't know wrapped up I am in it that I think they were just pretty stoked to see that for sure and friends yeah. like do they want to come do the same sort of thing um yeah I've had some like friends come and visit yeah it's been nice got some friends coming to visit soon and yeah, it's, yeah there's always someone coming from Perth being like yeah come to Melbourne soon come to the big smoke and you're like oh <laughs> Come to the big smoke. Big yeah, yeah, there's heaps of graph. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I still feel like such a small, like small town girl in a big city here. But so, say someone comes over for the weekend, they're like, "Hey, we're here, Jess. What are we going to do? What are you taking them out to do in Melbourne? What? How would you give them a good dose of, of Melbourne in uh, 48 hours?" Oh fuck. Um, potentially, I would actually say, don't come on the weekend because I'll either be working or sleeping. <laughs> So, so come on Monday and, yeah. and went Monday to Wednesday. Monday to Wednesday yeah. and I would take them around Abbotsford. I yeah. love Abbotsford. I love the area I found myself in. It's like you live in Vietnam but you also live It's It's a sort of little bit of a forgotten spot because there's Richmond, all of a sudden there's Collingwood and then Abbotsford's kind of that little, little pocket there. Yeah, and it's it's really cool. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I live in a foreign country but I'm in Melbourne, you know. Yeah. It's got great food. Um, it's got really good... I don't know, street atmosphere. There's always something to look at. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just, I don't know, man. I don't even know what I take them to do. Depends who's coming to visit, right? Yeah. I also love going to Collingwood Children's Farm. That People laugh cool. at me when I say that. No, nah, but... yeah. That is, that's a thing that's been there since I was a kid in kindergarten. You'd go there. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoy it. And it reminds, I think I really like it even more so because it reminds me a bit of home. Like, it, you know, it has a bit of like WA countryside vibe to it. It's it's a spit out, isn't it? Because you'll be in like Victoria Street. You just walk for a little bit and all of a sudden you're in the fucking bush. Yeah. You're like, where did that come from? Yeah, and there's cows there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but there's junkies like 300 metres that way. Yeah. Like, How it's does this wild. Work? Yeah. And the guy pissing on fire. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> do, you, do you feel safe in that area? It's a pretty hectic sort of part of town, though. I do now, but uh, the first day I moved in, there was someone, you know, doing some dodgy business like right out the front of my window, and I was like, "That's, you know, like like using heroin, like yeah. dodgy business." And it was like I, you know, I've seen other stuff in my life, but like I'm pretty anti that. So to see that like happening right out the front of my window and like see that as a regular thing, it's pretty confronting. confronting yeah. But you're safe. You're pretty safe, you know. And I've got a big dog. Like, Biggs is a big dog, so, yeah. yeah. Um, man, a guy who works for us, he had his laptop stolen when he went to the shower in his room. Someone came into his room just in... Did he lock his front room. door? No, but his housemates were home. This is, I just, you know what I mean. Lock your front door. Oh, yeah, this I is, know. like, step one. Yeah, I know. It's a, But that that isn't one of the... Yeah, that part of Victoria Street, man, there's a lot going on there. I'm guessing that's sort of part of Abbotsford. I don't know. That's yeah, no, thing. that's, like, I live... Right off there, yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's um, just going to Woolies too. is an adventure. You know? 
is. Yeah. Yeah, you're not far away from uh, Melbourne's only, and it's a contentious spot, the safe injecting room, which obviously brings a lot of pe- colourful people in, you know? Yeah, and even then, you know, like moving here, I was like, why, you know... I'm just so new to that world, you know. And it's, I have people be like, yeah, well, they had to put the rooms there or people are on the on the road dying and you just... Yeah. You know, it's just... It's a hectic world we live in, man, you know. And I just, like, I kind of see it and I kind of... I don't know. I'm pretty empathetic, so I see it. I'm like, fuck, like, I feel bad for them and then I'm, like, grateful that I, you know, didn't allow myself to ever go there. And then, like, it's just, like, a whole mixture of emotions just walking down Victoria Street. For sure. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a colourful place. That's what they told me when I was moving here. They said it's more colourful than Northbridge, and I couldn't figure out what that meant. But now so, I know. So colourful is a word for heroin, is it? Is that what we're using? I, I don't know what it is. I feel like it's just a word for... It's like a real estate agent word to say you're going to a kind of dodgy spot. But why say colourful, you know? There's so many other words. Okay, what are we using? I just think colourful means, like, it's fun and inviting. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, true. We need a thesaurus. We could, yeah. I'm sure there's some people over there who could come up with a with a good a good word for it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's talk about. You're, you're also here. teaching here as well. You're teaching, yeah, stuff here. And so, is that coming from the teaching you've done in WA and you're working for someone else here, or how did that sort of come about? Um, yeah, so that came about because, yeah, when I was moving over here, I called Casey up and was like, moving to Melbourne, man, let's do the school because um, he'd been talking about moving to Melbourne potentially or, you know, we'd always talked about doing the school together but just kind of, like, done other stuff. And, um, yeah, I remember when I first told him, he just, like, laughed and was like, you're moving to Melbourne? Like, oh, nah, man. He was like, oh, because it's dodgy there. And, like, you know. <laughs> Don't go well, to it's, Victoria it's hard, Street. It's hard, man. It's hard in Melbourne. Like, have you lined any gigs up? And, like, oh, you know, you got to set yourself up. And I was like, well, I'm doing it, man. So I'll see you when I get there. And then I called him when I got to Melbourne. I was like, I moved to Melbourne. Are you coming? And, yeah, it kind of just, like, I think just, like, amping him up to be, I don't know, as I said, I'm pretty much in my realm of just, like, just do it era, you know. So mm-hmm. I got Casey, who's, like, a bit more analytical, and he's been running the school for 30 years, and he, like, took a break over COVID, and I think also regained a little bit of, like, uh, control all of his life and, like, access to, you know, just enjoying his life mm-hmm. and not having to run a business. So I think, like, you know, just I just got to bring new life to it, and so calling him up and being like, yeah. I'm doing it, and we're doing it, and it's going to happen. Yeah. And just give him that. And I won't take no for an answer. So, <laughs> And it must, for someone like you've mentioned a few times that you don't do tutorials and that sort of thing, so to hands-on focus and teach other people the way that you wanted to learn must be pretty sweet as well. Yeah, it is. Because in a day and age now where realistically anyone can do YouTube tutorials on anything, to do, like, personal stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it really is, man. Like, you, 100%. If someone, like, someone could ask you, oh, teach me how to DJ, and you could just be like, go watch DJ Angelo on yeah. YouTube. <laughs> DJ Angelo. I'll yeah. That <laughs> or, you know, like, DJ City tutorials or um, Crossfader tutorials, you know, like, they're all out there. Like, mm-hmm. it's all available, but some people don't want to learn that way, so. No. Yeah, you need someone physically there to push you to show you the little things. Yeah. Move your hand here. Think about you're standing the wrong way, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that stuff you were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think so, man. Because, yeah, that's that's stuff that they don't necessarily show you online. And as well, I think some people are just looking for... Like, it's just nice to have the community there, you know? At, like, when you first start a term, like, the group of students might be a bit, you know, like, wary of each other or a bit more awkward. But then you see, like, a few weeks in, they're all, like, talking about DJ stuff together and, you know everyone's kind of like supporting each other it's just really nice yeah they're starting their own network within that sort of thing yeah know? dude yeah yeah have you how does that work at the end do they perform or do some sort of you know yeah so we've got a graduation in week 12 it's a 12 week comprehensive course so they have like a graduation night at the end and invite their family and friends down and everyone has a night of it but yeah they record a mix in like the last few weeks and then they perform that same you know mix um yeah live at graduation and yeah. generally impress you or something well normal. this is our first term together that we've been running it so yeah. i don't know i hope they impress me yeah this is out to me students but um <laughs> no i'm sure they will you know i think it gets like starts getting a bit more serious or people realize that like it's you know time to get serious with it the last like five or six weeks so. yeah so give the give it a shout out like so if people want to learn from you what, what do they do where do they go 
Uh, United DJ School, that's where it's at. Yeah, United DJ School, been running for 30 years. Um, and yeah, DJ KC, you got to check out his 1990 DMC routine. It's hectic. 1990? 1990, yeah. yeah. Man, John Course, the house that's DJ, the 88 his routine. Check that out on YouTube. True. It's crazy, man. All right, yeah, I will. Back in the days, man. Um, yeah, I know. So, briefly before, you mentioned you've been writing raps for a long time, but it's something that you hadn't actually done till recently, where I've seen the video, you did one, you, you put it out there. Yeah. How was that one. experience? Oh, that was, I was, yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty good. That felt pretty good, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, Grills had asked me if I wanted to rap on the cypher for the break and bread thing. Um, and yeah, that meant heaps, man. That was dope. Yeah, yeah. just wrote some raps and got on it and... Yeah, it was mad fun, man. And there's more of that to come? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, um, I don't know. I've, at the same time, I'm like, if I start thinking about it too much, I just, like, will think about it too much. So, Overthink it. As I said, yeah, I think I just have to, like, just do shit and put it out there and, like, fuck what people think. Yeah, for sure. And I guess it's a different sort of thing because obviously you're comf comfortable on the decks, but then you've got to find your own comfortability on the mic. It's a different sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, I'm very comfortable on the decks, and that comfort's still finding its way on a mic for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and production stuff. Obviously, you've got a big catalogue of beats we were looking at before. Is there more <laughs> of that stuff to come? Big catalogue of five beats. Oh, yeah. oh it took, well, you had to find the right one. Yeah, we had to find the right one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been working on beats and stuff still. Like, yeah, um, I could probably speeding up that process by watching some tutorials, but I'm not going to do it. No, okay, yeah, you're stubborn with that. We've figured that Very out. Very stubborn. So, yeah. yeah, I'm just going to keep, I don't know, just experimenting, just like messing around. Yeah, sample-based stuff. I know you saw in your story you were doing some guitar sort of riff stuff. Like, what, yeah. what do you want to do? Um, I feel like doing everything, man, yeah. Like, i got a bass at home and i got a guitar and I like, I like to kind of chop stuff up, like chop tracks up just by juggling and... I don't know, I've been finding a way to, like, make beats by doing that, okay. which I've found, like, really cool. Um, but, yeah, a bit of everything, man. Just been, like, finding new ways to – or just finding different ways to make music, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sam some sample chopping, some just, like, yeah, just making the drums from scratch and everything from scratch. Like. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that, well, that's – then you definitely have to jump into Ableton. Oh, yeah, I'm in Ableton. Like, that's what I'm using for it. So, yeah. Yeah. Because earlier you were saying, man, I didn't know what I was doing in Ableton. But if you're producing all, 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 everything from scratch, you've got to be pretty deep in Ableton now. Um, like I'm deep in what I know in Ableton. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, don't, I still don't really know what I'm doing. But uh, I know how the drums are meant to sound. And like I kind of have an idea of you like melody or like when keys sound wrong. Like, you know, I'll be making a beat for a whole day and be like, yeah, sounds pretty good. And the next day I'll open it and be like. That is so off key, and just have to change like a few things, and it sounds better, you know. There you go. So it's just part of the process, man. Yeah, yeah. and I guess having people with DJ schools and all that sort of stuff around you, you've got access to all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like I've got all that stuff at home, but yeah, with the school, like we we're running it at Kindred at the moment, so just keep the stuff there and wheel it out, and yeah. What about uh, the gig at Old Bar? Was it two weeks ago now? Mm, yeah, that was dope. Yeah? That was real dope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so Grace put that on, um, hit us hit us up all hit us all up. So uh, Phoenix, Helen Earth, Viliani, Grace and myself. And that was yeah, that was something else, man. Yeah. That was like very electric. Have you been involved in like an all female sort of thing like that before? Nah. No. Nah. No. Nah. Like I've been involved in like, I don't know. Ladies' nights and shit. <laughs> ladies' nights. So don't Two get for one don't champagne. Get started. That sounds bad. But nothing like that. That yeah. Okay. But and it was awesome. Like I obviously follow everyone on socials. I see you guys doing your uh, rehearsals and all that stuff. Was it a good sort of like you know girl power kind of chick gang when you're all hanging out doing your thing? Did you just say girl power? No, I don't know, man. It was a, there was a lot of like sort of feminine energy coming out of all the stories and stuff. Is that because we're female and Maybe. there was energy? Maybe. I don't know. But it was all female lineup, you know? Yeah, yeah. Look, I would say there was a lot of masculine energy in that, that female power, mind <laughs> okay. you. But no, nah, I don't even, like, that's the thing. You hear feminine and you just think of like well, soft or like whingy or like... Femininity or like there, there is you know a lot of those 
artists, whether they're male or female, are very forthright and uh, are great artists. You know what yeah. I mean? So they have energy and stage presence in general. But yeah. just happen to be all female. Yeah, 100%. We are all female and we are all dope <laughs> and we all slayed that. <laughs> did I dig myself out of that one? Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> I'll say you did, just I'll for now. Say, just for now, and then I'll, I'll say catch you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it, it, there obviously isn't a whole lot of uh, gigs that happen like that where we, we get a whole lineup of just, you know, all female people. So it must be cool just to be involved. Yeah, man, 100%. It was um, monumental to be involved. Like, if anything, you know, like, I think it's – it felt like – it feels like the start of something, 100%. Like, yeah. I'd never met – um, Jordan, like George before, like I barely hung out with Billy, like or Phoenix as well, Jess. Like mm-hmm. we've done the shows together, but to have those guys like hang out at my house like a couple of days before and like run through, you know, all their sets and just like really like bond together and mm-hmm. just like I don't know, man. Just to have all of those women in my room, like fucking ripping the dopest shit, like it just felt so. Like, that's surreal. Yeah. Like, and then to go perform it and have everyone in the room, like, so supportive. And, yeah, it was dope. More to come? Definitely, yeah. I think uh, Grace is talking about doing one in September. Yep. Yeah. Might be over in Tassie or somewhere else, but, yeah. Interstate. Yeah, man. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Do you want to tell us what else is coming up for you in 2024? It's We're almost halfway through the year now. What else has happened? Um, what else is happening? Um, get, definitely going to be pushing the school a bit more. I mm-hmm. want to be working with the school and get that up and running and um, hopefully find a permanent space to work from so that we can have a hub to really grow um, the turntablism culture and that community mm-hmm. um, even more so. But, yeah, well, um, me and Grills will be going on tour soon. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, do some Oz wide shows and all of that. Can we can we talk about that? Is that something that we, is, is yeah? I think I think yeah. we can. We're organising it. Yeah. yeah. So nothing's like set in stone yet, but yeah. um, yeah. Where are you going? Are you going all around? Yeah, we back should back to going, WA. Yeah, we're going all around. Yeah, I'll be going home and doing some shows back home. So that'll be cool. Yeah, it'll be really cool for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about that. Yeah, man. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, Ms. Hap, thanks for coming in. I appreciate you making the trek all the way down here. Thanks for having me, man. Nah, and uh, we might see if you'll jump on one of the tracks. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, fuck yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Me rapidy rap raps. Let's go. <laughs> no, thanks for coming. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, man. Thanks Cheers. For